Well, thank you for coming back this evening. And please take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, my message to you this evening really isn't going to be an exposition of, of Ephesians 2. I'd like to do this sermon on kind of the history and the theology of dispensationalism. And next Sunday night, I'd like to do a sermon on um, covenant theology, the, the polar opposite of dispensationalism. And, and that sermon will get into a lot more scripture than we will uh, this evening. And uh, I think that you'll see, see why uh, as we walk through dispensationalism. And the reason I wanted to read this passage, I believe Ephesians 2, 11 through 16, <coughs> is the single greatest refutation of old school dispensationalism in scripture. You cannot believe what this passage teaches and be a dispensationalist. You can't. So let's look at it. Ephesians 2, 11 through 16. This is God's word. Therefore remember that you, formerly, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. May God bless the reading of his word. And of course, who are the two groups there? Jews and Gentiles. Out of the two, he has made one. Okay, let's, cl let's, let's close in prayer. Let's open in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this time to be together. We pray you would help us uh, to understand the history and the doctrine, the theology of dispensationalism, what's wrong with it. And we pray that uh, we would not be taken in by this false system uh, that is very new in church history, un unheard of prior to the 19th century. And we pray that we would walk away from this evening with a better understanding of where these ideas came from, and we pray that we would believe what the Word of God teaches about grace, about your covenant of grace, about the covenant of works, about Israel and the church, and we pray that we would understand that better this evening, and especially uh, next Sunday evening as we walk through the text of your Word and what it does teach about these wonderful truths. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Dispensationalism is a, a branch of Christian theology that arose in the 19th century, that means in the 1800s, and it teaches five basic things. Now, I'm going to convert my, my notes here into a PDF, into a Word document, and just send it to the church, so you don't need to write all this stuff down. But there's a lot of information here, and this is kind of the distilled version of, of a lot of work. Number one, it claims to be the only system that interprets the Bible literally and consistently. It claims to be the only system of interpretation that interprets the Bible literally and consistently. Two, dispensationalism teaches that biblical history, and in fact all the Bible, can only be understood in light of several fundamentally different and historically distinguishable economies, which it calls dispensations. And in each of these dispensations, God has interacted with man in very different ways, they say. Thirdly, and this is one of the keys to understanding the whole system, it draws a very sharp theological distinction between Israel and the church. Israel and the church. Four, it reduces the New Testament church to plan B in God's overall design for history. It, it relegates the Christian church to being plan B in God's original plans for the world. Fifthly, it emphasizes end times prophecy, focusing especially on the secret rapture of the church, followed by a seven-year period of worldwide tribulation, which will end with the second coming of Christ when he establishes his political rule, a golden Jewish millennium on earth for a thousand years, where there will be a rebuilt temple, and they will reinstitute temple sacrifices and all the rest of it. <clears throat> 
So those are the five main things this system teaches. The dispensationalist approach to the Bible, I believe, has hurt the church. It has hurt the Great Commission. And even the very nature of the gospel itself is undercut by dispensational theology. One scholar, Oz Guinness, wrote that dispensationalism, quote, reinforces anti-intellectualism by its general indifference to serious engagement with culture. Put simply, it is a form of the earlier false polarization and shrunken pietism reinforced by a distracting preoccupation with the end times. Remember what I've given you, some of the other quotations from dispensationalists who have said, the worse things get in the world, the more excited I am. The darker it is, the more light my heart is, because I know we're going to get raptured out of here sooner. The worse things get, we get more excited. Instead of discipling the nations, we've turned our attention to the newspaper, doing what Gary DeMar and others have called newspaper exegesis, looking for events in the Middle East and trying to pin them into Bible prophecy, Look, looking to the Middle East, looking to wild speculations about odd end time scenarios, about microchips in our hands and foreheads. And uh, I was taught growing up that the locusts that come out of the pit in the book of Revelation are actually Huey helicopters. Really? You think anyone that read Revelation originally thought that? We've forgotten our King's Commission. All this has caused much of the church in America really to turn its back on the world in which it actually lives. Instead of entering into all the disciplines of life to bring a Christian worldview into them, we've created a Christian ghetto, a Christian version of everything in society because what, does it, what difference does it make what goes on in the world? It's all going to hell in a handbasket. We're going to get raptured out of here and they're all going to be left behind. And so these wild ideas have caused much of the church, at least in America, to turn its back on the world in which it actually lives. The dispensational scheme has broken continuity with church history. It wrongly interprets the word of God. It has been a willing participant in the church's trend toward anti-intellectualism. It embraces Greek philosophical dualism that comes dangerously close to the ancient heresy of Gnosticism. And I want to point out to you, dispensationalism is very recent. This to me was the biggest revelation in studying dispensationalism years ago. It's very recent in church history, and I will say this as strongly as I can to you. The distinctive elements of dispensationalism have no biblical support at all. The distinctive elements of dispensational theology and eschatology have no biblical support. None. And so I want to give you four more things about dispensationalism. Number one, it has a flawed method of biblical interpretation, a deeply flawed method of biblical interpretation. Secondly, it has embraced an unbiblical view of the church and Israel, treating them as if they are two separate peoples with two separate plans of salvation. And thirdly, it's not an eschatology built on theology, but rather a theology that's built on its eschatology. And fourthly, it inevitably leads, and has always led, historically, to cultural withdrawal and surrender. And that's why, in our time, there aren't very many people entering into history to become historians. There aren't many people entering into science anymore. Now, thankfully, there's been a resurgence of that. I'm very thankful many Christians have felt like, I, I need to be a geologist. We need to retake that for, for the Lord. I need to be a historian. We need to retake history for the Lord. I need to go into art and painting and music and retake it for God and go into all these disciplines. You know, that's why the Reformation changed the world. It redeemed all those callings and vocations, and people saw every calling and vocation, we want to we want to retake it for the Lord. Whereas dispensationalism says, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, who cares about it? We're going to get raptured out of here sooner rather than later, so who cares about culture? Why polish the brass on the Titanic? It's all going down anyway. Dispensationalism's near opposite, covenant theology, also distinguishes, however, between dispensations or economies. But covenant theology does not believe those dispensations, listen, that they differ in their essence. Why is that? The biblical doctrine of God, man, sin, grace, salvation, Christ's person and work, and the application of redemption to sinners makes the notion of different ways of salvation at different times impossible. So I want to ask you the question. Think about this. When Adam fell into sin, 
If Adam was going to go to heaven, what had to happen to him? He needed to be born again. He needed to be justified. When Abraham first came to know the Lord, what had to happen to him in order for him to be able to go to heaven? He had to be regenerated. He had to be born again. And I want to say as, as emphatically to you as I can say, regeneration is not unique to the new covenant. Justification by an imputed righteousness is not new to the new covenant. Those essential gospel truths are not new. They are part of Old Testament revelation. They are part of New Testament revelation. God is not able to interact with man in different ways in terms of how he has saved man. The way that he saved Adam is exactly the same way he'll save the last Christian person before they die and go on into glory. And so the gospel, in its essence, has never changed. And so the dispensational idea that God has one way of salvation and man thwarts it, and then he comes up with another way of salvation, man thwarts it, and boy, aren't you glad we live in the age of grace rather than the age of law, because not very many people were making it in. In fact, I heard a dispensationalist actually say once, you know, the contract was pretty bad back then. Not many people were making it, so thankfully he renegotiated the contract, and now we live under grace. That is so far removed from biblical revelation that it's hard to even criticize that in a way that's charitable. Covenant theology doesn't believe that the dispensations differ in their essence because God is still the same God, sin is still the same, the fall is still the same, our condition is still the same. Now, one of the most important dispensational writers in modern times is Charles Ryrie. Has anyone here ever had a Ryrie study Bible? Okay. <laughs> okay. There, my, my father has one on the, on the coffee table. I'm, I'm always glad it's still sitting there and it's not open. He said this on page 41 of his book, Dispensationalism, quote, the distinction between Israel and the church. This grows out of dispensationalism's consistent employment of normal or plain or historical grammatical interpretation. It doesn't, by the way. And it reflects an understanding of the basic purpose of God and all his dealings with mankind. You hear what he's saying? Essential to dispensational thinking is this hard distinction between Israel and the church. That is an essential to dispensationalist theology, that the, the Jewish people, the physical descendants of Israel, are one people, and then over here you have this other group called the church, and the, the two are distinct peoples with their own distinct purposes and their own distinct plans. You see why I read Ephesians 2, 11 through 16? What did the Apostle Paul write under divine inspiration? Out of the two, he has made one. There is one body of Christ. There is one church in this world, one and only one. That was true before, um, Christ came, it's true after Christ came. There is one church. Now, the church, as I said before, the dispensational scheme looks at the church as a parenthesis. What, do you, what, is, what are parentheses used for in a sentence? You're writing something in a sentence, and oh yeah, I forgot to include this other thing. You put it in parenthesis about that, and then you go on with the next thing. That's how dispensationalism sees us, the church. We're just plan B. God sent Jesus with an offer of the kingdom to Israel. Israel rejected it, so God says, all right, I guess he'll go to the cross and we'll do this grace thing for a couple thousand years, but eventually we're going to rapture the church off the earth and go back to dealing with national Israel again. Okay, That's basically the, the dispensational system. Israel is really the center of God's program. All of God's redemptive purposes are to be realized through the nation of Israel. The church only comes into existence as kind of an afterthought, a plan B. I mean, the old dispensationalists called the church plan B, since plan A didn't work. They rejected the offer of the kingdom. Therefore, the church doesn't exist until Acts chapter 2. When Peter preaches that sermon, repent, believe, thousands are baptized, I want to emphasize this to you as strongly as I can, because if you don't get this point, you will not understand dispensationalism, and you need to understand this. In the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, Charles Ryrie, a dispensationalist, wrote the article on dispensationalism. And he wrote this under bolded and italicized letters, essential characteristics. Listen to Ryrie. Here's what he says is essential to dispensationalism. Dispensationalism distinguishes God's program for Israel from his program for the church. The church did not begin in the Old Testament, but on the day of Pentecost. You hear that? And the church is not presently fulfilling promises made to Israel in the Old Testament that have not yet been fulfilled, he says, end quote. Now, everything in me wants to go off and just let's look at Scripture and look at how, how 
seriously, thoroughly, completely that is refuted. We are the fulfillment of the promises God made to Israel in the Old Testament. What are we called in the New Testament? We are the true Jews. We are the Israel of God. Circumcision doesn't mean anything. Circumcision of the heart. We are the children of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. We are the true Jews, the true Israel. And so Ryrie, it's, it's fascinating to read him. What he says is so often the precise opposite of what the Bible says. It really is striking to read what he has to say. So I'll, I'll, we'll get into that next Sunday night. Dispensationalism sees the Christian church as a second separate people from Israel. The church is completely distinct from Israel. Maintaining this distinction in Charles Ryrie's thinking is, quote, the most basic theological test of whether or not a person is a dispensationalist, and it is undoubtedly the most practical and conclusive test. The one who fails to distinguish Israel and the church consistently will inevitably not hold to dispensationalist distinctions, and one who does will. Okay, so that's the first essential characteristic of dispensational theology. There is a hard distinction between Israel and the church. Secondly is dispensationalism's, I would say, morbid focus on eschatology. I mean, eschatology is everything to them. Now, obviously, eschatology is extremely important. But for them, the study of last things, the return of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, the final judgment, the end of the world, in di the dispensationalist scheme, what is the next grand event that Christians are waiting for in the world? The rapture, right? The rapture. That's on their timeline, on their chart of end times events, what we're waiting for next is the rapture. God getting the whole Christian church off the earth so we can go back to dealing with national Israel again. And that is followed by, in their scheme, seven years of tribulation. If you look at Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, you have the, the seven weeks and 62 weeks and 69 weeks. Supposedly, there's about a 2,000-year gap between the 69th and the 70th week. I would just ask you, read the prophecy in Daniel 9 and ask yourself, is there a gap here between the 69th and the 70th week? And by the way, also, in the 70th week, what happens in the 70th week of that prophecy you have Messiah, the prince, comes and makes reconciliation for iniquity and brings in an everlasting righteousness. What do you think that's a prophecy about? The cross. If you say the 70th week hasn't happened yet, many Reformed commentators for years have said, you guys are laying an ax to the root of the gospel. You're saying that God hasn't done this yet? That that doesn't happen until the 70th week that's supposedly at least 2,000 years away from us right now? But anyway, dispensationalists are saying the next thing we're waiting for is the rapture of the church. That's followed by the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, the seven years of tribulation, and that's cut into two halves, 3.5 years of peace, 3.5 years of war. Following this is the second coming of Christ. Then there's a literal 1,000-year-long reign of Christ on earth, which culminates at the end with Christ forming a new heavens and a new earth. Now, I want to point out to you, every form of premillennialism has the same problem. Every form of premillennialism, whether it's historic premillennialism, which there are some good scholars that are historic premill, and then there's dispensational premill, and I'll explain the difference here in a moment. But whatever form of premillennialism you hold to, they're all going to have the same problem. And I will say that learning about what I'm going to tell you, it got rid of every last vestige of premillennialism from my thinking years ago. Dr. Kim Rodelbarger summarizes a major problem with this whole scheme. The idea that Jesus comes back, raises the dead, and then there's a 1,000-year-long millennial reign on the earth. Here's the main problem with it. Listen, this conception of the millennial age is highly problematic, despite the apparent literal reading of Revelation 20. <clears throat> According to premillenarians, the millennium is a period in which people who were raised from the dead and now live on earth in resurrected bodies coexist with people who were not raised from the dead and remain in the flesh. How can this be? Where does Scripture teach such a mixture of resurrected and unresurrected individuals? So think about the premillennial scheme. Jesus comes back. He, he raises the dead. He, he raises Christians from the dead, and they're glorified, and then they cohabitate the earth with the mortals that were still alive when he got here. Think about that. For a thousand years, supposedly, resurrected, glorified Christians cohabitate the earth with mortals that are still getting married and having babies. 
Virgil Barger says, As we have seen, the New Testament writers all anticipated the final consummation at the time of our Lord's second coming. They did not anticipate a halfway step of an earthly millennium before the final consummation, such as that associated with all forms of premillennialism. Perhaps even more problematic is the dilemma raised by the premillennial insistence that people in natural bodies live on the earth alongside Christ and his resurrected saints. How do people live living on the earth at the time of Christ's second coming escape the resurrection and the judgment? That's the very same thing I thought. When I first was really introduced, here's what they're saying. What happens biblically when Jesus comes the second time? The resurrection, the judgment, the eternal state. It's over. It's over. There is no 1,000-year halfway house. When he comes back, that's the day of the resurrection. That's the end. And so that's a devastating question. Think about that again. He says, how do people living on the earth at the time of his second coming escape the resurrection and the judgment? The scriptures are very clear that Christ return. Christ returns to judge the world, raise the dead, and renew the cosmos. According to Paul, dead believers are raised at Christ's coming. Living believers are caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. This includes all believers, whether living or dead. But those who are not Christ, we are told, face his wrath and are taken to face final judgment. Matthew 24, 37 to 41. This includes all unbelievers living at the time of our Lord's return. Therefore, premillenarians must explain the identity of these people in unresurrected bodies living during the millennium. How do they account for people who are not judged or raised from the dead at the time of our Lord's second advent? End quote. That was, that was the end of all forms of premillennialism for me. There is nothing in scripture to support it. Now, as far as the history of dispensationalism, where in the world did this come from? How did this happen? Now, before we get into the main players, I just want to say one of the reasons that it's been so successful and so many people know about it and so many people have embraced it is they started a Bible school movement. Many of its early proponents started Bible schools and prophecy conferences. They started doing these big prophecy conferences in response to the liberal, liberalization of American seminaries. It was attractive to people that were refugees from the liberalization of American churches there in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Dispensationalism was seen as the only school of thought that really believes the Bible is literally God's word. And many think dispensationalism is the only system of theology that takes the Bible at face value, literally. And that everything else out there is by definition liberal. You know who else thought that that was the case? me. I thought if you're all millennial, you're liberal. If you don't believe this, you don't believe the Bible's true. You don't believe it literally. This has been a potent mix for spreading dispensationalist thought and people holding to it tenaciously. Think about it. If you really think that dispensationalism alone represents true conservative Bible-believing Christianity, then merely hearing about some other perspective will be viewed with great suspicion that it's the fruit of unbelief and Liberalism. You know what modern Bible teacher has made that comment before? That if you're not a dispensationalist, you're, you have liberal tendencies? John MacArthur has said that. Yeah, there's this view called amillennialism, tends to be held by liberals. I'm thinking, that was the view held by Augustine and Calvin and Luther and almost all the Westminster divines. What are you talking about? That's a liberalizing tendency. Now, how did dispensationalism become so dominant in America? It has an attraction to it, as I said, because the, we interpret the Bible literally. Often everyone else is discarded as a liberal. If, you don't, if you're not a dispensationalist, you must be a secret closet liberal or something. In the midst of all the apostasy and the abandoning of biblical authority, people liked the idea of a system that holds the highest view possible of biblical inspiration and inerrancy, and it takes the Bible seriously enough to take it literally. I mean, don't you want to take the Bible literally? I do, according to its genre, not, not in a wooden, weird sense, but I want to interpret Scripture literally and believe it. It also arose in a time of great apostasy and decline in the church. In the mid-19th century, Charles Darwin writes what? The origin of species. Millions of years are being thrown at theologians and pastors to try to find some place to put them in the Bible. German higher critical scholarship is undermining biblical authority with all of its anti-supernatural biases. 
for the Bible-believing, conscientious Christian in America, they thought that the progenitors of dispensationalism, they said, hey, they're on our side. All this liberalization and apostasy and unbelief, the dispensationalists, they're on our side, be, on our side because they take the Bible literally. Another reason it's so popular is its fascination with speculation regarding events around the second coming of Christ. What's one of the best-selling novel series of all time? The Left Behind series. How, how many books are in that series? I mean, it's enough to fill an entire level on a bookshelf, isn't it? And people eat that stuff up, all the speculation and all the stuff about microchips and the rise of Antichrist and one world government and all the rest of it. They speak in very clear terms about exciting and odd, weird things that are going to happen in their lifetime, which by the rapture, we all get to escape eventually. This has proven, I believe, to be a massive distraction. It's a massive distraction from true biblical evangelism and has led to innumerable false conversions. I just want to tell you, just so you all know, scaring people with the idea of living through seven years of hell on earth and getting them to walk an aisle and pray a prayer so they'll escape that tribulation, that's not real evangelism. That's not real evangelism. Scaring people with the idea of being left behind for seven years of tribulation, that's not how we're supposed to do evangelism. Nobody ever got saved by being scared of living through a difficult time here on earth. People come to Jesus truly only when the Spirit convicts them of their sin against the Holy God. Not wanting to be left behind when a rapture happens is not the same as repenting and coming to Christ. Dispensationalist system fascinates people because it starts with the next grand event in human history, the secret rapture of the church, wherein every living Christian person on earth is going to vanish into thin air immediately. And you've all seen the weird movie depictions of this, haven't you? You all seen the Left Behind movies? You haven't? Oh, everyone, people are shaking their head. Y'all can spend the rest of the Sabbath day praising God for that. We were traumatized with that stuff. <laughs> I mean, seriously. So much so that even when I became Reformed, remember I told you the story, I thought I'd been left behind when I worked in downtown Cincinnati because everyone's coats were just hanging there, the computers are on, and I thought I'd been left behind. Now, if you haven't seen those things, just be thankful for that. <clears throat> if you aren't taken in the rapture, you're going to be here for the world going through the hardest season of time in all of world history, seven years of tribulation on earth. Dispensationalism focuses so much attention on trying to figure out who the Antichrist will be that it focuses little attention on the gospel and little attention on Jesus. Dispensationalists have continually had the problem of setting dates for the rapture. And what led to a fever pitch of trying to set dates? When Israel became a nation again, three years after World War II was over. 1948, Israel becomes its own nation again. Dispensational writers went bananas about it and started writing books. How, how long is a generation? Is it 30 years? Is it 40 years? As more time has marched by, I was like, well, it's 25 years. Okay, maybe it's 33 years. Well, maybe it's 40 years. I mean, what are we up to now? <laughs> We're getting pretty far. I mean, what is it, 74 years? All those dates have one thing in common. They're all wrong. This has brought disrepute to dispensationalism, but in America in particular, it has also brought shame to the entire church, dispensationalist or not. Nevertheless, it amazes me, this continues to be the dominant position in Bible-believing churches today. So influential is dispensational eschatology that even Roman Catholics very often believe in the rapture. And people from other traditions that have no connection to dispensationalism will believe it because they've read the Left Behind books too. Do you see why this position would inevitably lead to cultural disengagement on the part of Christians? Remember when we mentioned that Christian people today need to have a long-haul approach to the world around us, a long-haul approach to the Great Commission? The final point I want to make to you in this introduction to dispensationalist theology is this. Historically, Christian people were not looking forward to the rapture. Historically, Christians have never been looking forward to the rapture. What have Christians always been looking forward to? The second coming. The second coming of Christ. And I want to tell you, the next event, the next grand event, is the second coming of Christ. 
We believe that God's going to save a whole huge generation of Israel. We saw that in Romans 11 and bring in multitudes more Gentiles before it's all over. But the next grand redemptive historical event is the second coming of Christ. Growing up dispensationalist, we needed a huge chart. Y'all ever seen the charts to explain dispensational eschatology? They're big because it's pretty complicated. Those charts included three, sometimes four separate resurrections and several second comings of Christ, so to speak. They also include the odd notion, as I said, that resurrected, glorified Christians cohabitate the earth for a thousand years with mortals who are still getting married, having babies, and dying. After looking more closely at the Bible on these subjects years ago, I listened to a tape by Kim Riddlebarger. It's a, it was a 13-tape series. I listened to that over and over and over again, looking up all the passages and He's amillennial, and by the way, we're amillennial too, we just are much more optimistic about the future, but we're amillennial in our general eschatology as well, and I'll never forget the way that Riddlebarger ended that entire series. It was like 15 hours of lectures, and he goes through all the passages, and he says, one thing I love about our eschatology is it's simple. We don't need a chart. Christ is coming back, and everything happens when he comes back, and that's our eschatology. It's real simple. The resurrection, the final judgment, the inauguration of the new heavens and new earth, it all happens when, he, when Jesus comes back. Now I want to explain to you historically where did dispensationalism come from. One Reformed author, Ernest Riesinger, said this, quote, It is my conviction that many who are presently disposed toward dispensationalism would not be victims of the system if they were better acquainted and informed about the system and its history its theological roots, and the doctrinal errors it has spawned, end quote. Many Christians just assume that because the idea of a hard distinction between Israel and the church, followed by cultural decline, followed by a secret rapture, seven years of tribulation, second coming, the, the, the first second coming of Christ inaugurates an earthly millennium, at the end of which there's a second, second coming, I guess that would be a third coming of Christ, followed by another coming of Christ at the end of the millennium, after which we'll begin the eternal state. That that, because that is what Hal Lindsey told the world in his best-selling book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and because that's the idea taught in thousands of pulpits all over our country, that therefore that must be the way that Christians have always understood the Bible in end-time scenarios. That's what I thought. Didn't everybody believe that? What I'm going to show you is that nothing could be further from the truth. The scheme I just spelled out for you is uniformly, utterly unknown in the first 1,830 years of church history. Not a single interpreter of scripture saw this in the Bible. These ideas were not believed by anybody until the 19th century. None of the ancient creeds mention a rapture, none of them. None of the Reformed confessions, like the Augsburg Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Second Helvetic Confession, the Belgic Confession, the 1689 London Baptist Confession, or the Westminster Standards mention any of this. The dispensational scheme, as you've already seen, requires a belief in at least two second comings of Christ, at least two separate resurrections of the dead, separated by a thousand years, and two final judgments. If nobody ever thought the Bible taught this until the 19th century, where do they come from? Where do these ideas come from then? It's often pointed out by some of the dispensationalists that, hey, a handful of the early church fathers were premillennial in their eschatology, and that's true. But listen, being premillennial does not mean you're a dispensationalist. Being premillennial does not mean you're a dispensationalist. People will also point out that someone like James Montgomery Boyce, who's a great Reformed scholar, George Eldon Ladd, another really good Bible scholar, held to what's called historic premillennialism. But there's a huge distinction between historic premillennialism and dispensational premillennialism. Historic premillennial eschatology does not hold to the hard church Israel distinction. That's the first thing. Montgomery, James Montgomery Boyce, George Eldon Ladd, others, they, didn't, they don't believe that distinction is legit. It does not believe in the rapture either, followed by seven years of tribulation. Historic pre eschatology does not believe in the rapture or a seven-year tribulation on earth prior to the first of two second comings of Christ, etc. Other premillennialists would include in the early church, Papias, Justin Martyr, uh, there in the early church, Francis Schaeffer was historic pre-mill, J. Barton Payne, a few others, 
They would all reject, however, the heart of dispensational eschatology, which is the distinction between Israel and the church. Without that distinction, there is no dispensationalism. Always remember that. The, the thing that dispensationalism rises and falls with is the hard distinction between Israel and the church. Now, Justin Martyr was clearly not a dispensationalism in that regard. Justin Martyr believed in covenant theology. Justin Martyr believed in covenant theology. Listen to this quotation from Justin Martyr. He died around 165 AD, quote, For the true spiritual Israel and descendants of Judah, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, who in uncircumcision was approved of and blessed by God on account of his faith and called the father of many nations, are we who have been led to God through this crucified Christ. What does Justin Martyr understand? We are Israel. All believers in Jesus Christ are Israel. No dispensationalist would ever say that. Would ever say that. Justin is biblical in his understanding of the Abrahamic covenant. He is not in any way, shape, or form a dispensationalist. He believes exactly what we believe in our church. That all true believers in Jesus Christ, we are the true Israel. We are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. The early church did not look at some parts of scripture as addressed to the Jews, other parts addressed to the church. There is, biblically speaking, one church. The church doesn't begin in the New Testament. The church begins with Adam, Abel, Seth, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Daniel. They're all part of the same church that we're part of. The one church that we are a part of. In the second century, the church father Irenaeus said this, quote, But in Christ... Every blessing is summed up, and therefore the latter people has snatched away the blessings of the former from the father, just as Jacob took away the blessing of Esau. For which cause his brother suffered the plots and persecutions of a brother, just as the church suffers this selfsame thing from the Jews. In the fourth century, Ambrosi asked, I'll just give you one more quotation. Thus, whoever believes that Christ Jesus was promised to Abraham is a child of Abraham and a brother of Isaac. You see what he's saying? He, he, Ambrosiaster read his Bible. Irenaeus read the New Testament. They understood this stuff. He says, Abraham was told that all the nations will be blessed in his offspring. This happened not in Isaac, but in him who was promised to Abraham in Isaac, that is Christ, in whom all the nations are blessed when they believe. Therefore, the other Jews are children of the flesh because they are deprived of the promise and cannot claim Abraham's merit because they do not follow the faith by which Abraham is counted worthy, end quote. What does that tell us? Ambrosiaster's covenantal. He's not dispensational in his understanding of this stuff, in view of his Bible, reading his Bible. When pastors, theologians, church fathers, and churchmen of the early centuries, the Middle Ages, and modern times, when they had their noses down in the Bible, they saw the covenantal unity of the gospel. They saw the unity of the gospel. They saw the unity of what the signs represent. Circumcision and baptism are signs of the same spiritual reality. Passover at the Lord's Supper, signs of the same spiritual reality. And the unity of how men were saved through all the ages of time. They did not think Israel was a separate people from the church with a separate plan of salvation that differed from that of the church. Israel was the church. And today the church is called what? Israel. The early church fathers did not make that dispensationalist distinction between Israel and the church. In the New Testament, Gentiles are grafted into the already existing Jewish church. Remember that? That's one of the reasons we're told, do not become arrogant against Jews. Because they were broken off so you guys could be brought in. Okay, the root supports you. God chose them first. You show them respect. The broken off Jewish branches, they will one day be grafted back in and when they're brought back in, it's going to be life from the dead. If they're being broken off, meant the reconciliation of the Gentile world, what's going to happen when they come back in to their own root? It's going to be life from the dead. It's going to be salvation en masse for the world. There is one people of God and one church of God. It is spelled out so clearly in Scripture. Remember I told you we, when we examined uh, one of the candidates for ministry long ago, uh, we always asked them all, asked them, what is covenant theology? And the, the best answer I ever heard was, one God, one promise, one people, one gospel, one hope. And I wanted to jump up and applaud the guy. I was like, that's what I'm talking about right there. That's good. Another common mistake that people will make is this, however. They'll say, well, the Westminster Confession uses the word dispensation. Does that mean we're dispensationalists? Not at all. In the chapter of, of God's covenant with man, 
It says that there are not therefore two covenants of grace differing in substance, but one and the same <clears throat> under various dispensations. God had a different way of making his grace and his salvation known before Christ got here. It was a different way of worship. It was a different way of approaching God. But it was the same gospel message. There is one covenant of grace, and it's administered in two different ways. Before Christ came, it was administered through circumcision, and, and it was administered through the Passover, and it was administered with, less, or with more outward glory by promises, sacrifices, and prophecies, all for signifying Christ to come, by which they had full remission of sins and eternal life. For us, it's administered through the word and the sacraments now. But it's the same one covenant of grace in, administered in two different dispensations. That doesn't mean we're dispensationalists. We're not saying, well, back then, people used to be saved by law-keeping. Now they're saved by grace. It was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David were saved by grace and faith in the coming Messiah. We are saved by grace through faith in Messiah having already come. So <clears throat> there were those two stewardships, those two administrations. Now, the old school dispensationalists have clearly stated, clearly stated, that without their understanding, nobody can un understand the Bible correctly. The old school dispensationalists said that over and over and over again in their writings. Without us, without our understanding of this stuff, no one can understand the Bible. Now, think about what that means. Without that system of interpretation that comes onto the scene for the first time in 1830, no one understood the Bible. That means Augustine... Irenaeus, the Puritans, the Westminster Divines, the Reformers, John Owen, Luther, Calvin, Edwards, and hundreds of others did not understand Bible prophecy. I would like to su suggest to you that's absurd. So where do these odd ideas come from? Here's a name that you need to be familiar with. John Nelson Darby. You all need to know about John Nelson Darby. 1800 to 1882 are his dates. 1800 to 1882. Now, John Nelson Darby was in the Anglican Church, which was being overrun with deadness, higher criticism, and a loss of zeal for the Lord. And he became very disenchanted with the Anglican Church. Around 1827, so he's about, he's about 27 years old, Darby fell off of his horse. And while he was recovering from his injuries in Dublin, he came into contact with a little group of professing believers called the Brethren. That's another thing you need to know about, the Brethren. What happened in many places in the 1800s was what became known as the Restorationist Movement. That's another phrase. You need to know what the Restorationist Movement was. Here, here's what Restorationism is. Please listen to me. There was a belief that less than two centuries after the time of Christ, the church had essentially disappeared from the earth. It was gone. It apostatized, disappeared. And many people in the 19th century rose up and proclaimed themselves to be appointed by God to restore the church to the earth. And so the restorationist movement is not a reformation. It had nothing to do with Protestantism or Catholicism. These were individuals who believed that they were restoring the church to the earth. That the church was gone. You know who two of those major progenitors were was Alexander and Thomas Campbell, the founders of what? The Church of Christ. The Church of Christ. Another, Joseph Smith. You know what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was originally called? The Church of Christ. Church of Christ. John Nelson Darby was another one, part of the Restorationist movement. Another individual, Charles Taze Russell, the founder of what? The Jehovah's Witnesses. Many cults started because of that idea. Evidently, none of these people understood Jesus' promise. Matthew 16, 18, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. The whole underlying current of all the restorationist movement is deeply flawed. Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail. And these guys are saying basically, no, it did prevail. It did prevail for most of the last 2,000 years until God raised me up to restore it to the earth. John Nelson Darby aligned himself with the Plymouth Brethren and became one of its most important figures. It was reactionary to the deadness of the Church of England. Their first meeting was in England in December of 1831. John Nelson Darby becomes so influential in this movement that his followers eventually become called uh, Darbyites. Because of conflict among the leaders and essentially no clearly defined doctrine, of the church or officers of the church, it quickly did what? It split over and over and over again. It scattered many times, split many times, recombined some of those splits many times. 
But one distinctive theological element of all brethren churches, all the way down to today, is their rejection of clergy. Brethren churches do not believe in having ordained ministers whatsoever. No pastors, no ministers. No pastors, no ministers. And that's one of the reasons they've always split and fractured millions of times. Now, the French Revolution had just happened earlier in the late 1700s, 1789, and it goes on for a long time, and France is basically at war with most of Europe, and then you have the Napoleonic era, Napoleon seizes power there and becomes a ruthless dictator. The French Revolution was such a cataclysmic event that starts right before the time of the Restorationist movement that many Christians started speculating, does the French Revolution have end-time prophetic significance to it? A lot of Christians started speculating about it because the French Revolution was so obviously and maliciously anti-Christian that people were starting to think, is, this, is France the Antichrist? And is Napoleon the Antichrist? Or is Robespierre the Antichrist? Is all this stuff that's going on, is this part of Bible prophecy? And this gives rise to all sorts of speculative ideas about prophecy among believers, and then prophecy conferences start happening. And people become very interested in this stuff. John Nelson Darby came up with the idea that the church is going to be secretly raptured out of the world before another great, terrible tribulation happens. And Darby admits, when he comes up with that idea, that it was, quote, the, the thoughts were new, he says. The thoughts were new, and he called it new wine. His doctrine of the rapture of the church, he called it new wine. That's in 1834. Over the next 15 years, all sorts of tracts are published and spread. This new idea, there's going to be a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation. For J.N. Darby, however, this is the saddest part of this history. His influence seems to have really gone to his head. Vern Poitras, in his book, Understanding Dispensationalists, he wrote, quote, Darby's contribution may have started with a zeal for Christ, but it ended with an indiscriminate rejection of everyone out of conformity with his ideas, end quote. Darby was out of control by the end of his life. He was unable in any sense to be a churchman or a team player at all. Charles Spurgeon had a lot of run-ins with the Plymouth Brethren. Spurgeon said this, quote, this controversial feeling, often degenerating into something resembling regular quarrels, is the chronic condition of Plymouth Brethrenism. They are in a state of constant antagonism with the Bethesda party. That's just one of a bazillion smaller groups they spawn. When they have no one of the opposite party to quarrel with, they disagree among themselves, end quote. J. N. Darby started to function in that group almost like a pope, like a despot. Spurgeon said this, quote, Mr. Darby is, to all intents and purposes, a thorough pope, though under a Protestant name. He will never admit that he is in error, and therefore very naturally declines to argue with those who controvert the soundness of his views, end quote. Many people started leaving Darby's Plymouth Brethren group, and when they tried to join other splinter groups of the Brethren, Darby would excommunicate them and their leaders, and there was a huge split with a fellow named George Mueller. I'm sure many of you have heard of George Mueller. Remember George Mueller, the orphanage guy? Wonderful man of God. I'm sure a lot of you know about George Mueller. Mueller took people in that had been thrown out of Darby's group, and he founded another group called the Open Brethren. Darby was enraged by this, and he labeled Mueller a heretic. And Mueller later, later wrote this. He said, quote, I am a constant reader of the Bible, and I soon found out that what I was taught to believe did not always agree with what my Bible said. I came to see that I must either part company with John Darby or with my Bible, and I chose to cling to my Bible and part from Mr. Darby, end quote. George Mueller, a man that history tells us, read his Bible from cover to cover at least 200 times in his life. He points out what I believe is obvious to everybody. Listen, nobody reading their Bible has ever, will ever, come up with dispensationalism. Remember, you all have heard me teach on eschatology. When I was given books and tapes and pamphlets about it, I remember sitting down with a Bible and going through the dispensational scheme and looking at their use of Gog and Magog from Ezekiel and learning that that's the Russian invasion of Israel and how microchips are going to be in our hands and eventually people will realize 
Um, well, hands are easy to cut off and carry around. Let's put it, the microchip in people's foreheads because to lop off people's heads and carry their heads around is a lot harder to conceal a head than it is a hand. I was taught that that's what the Bible taught. My assumption was, obviously, I am not intelligent enough to understand this section of the Bible. Eschatology can just stay on the shelf from now on. Eventually, after all the fighting and splitting, Darby began to believe that only his little faction of brethren were real Christians who met in Christ's name. Eventually, he got true church syndrome. Only me and my group are the real Christians on earth. The rest of the church, totally corrupt. One modern brethren writer addressed the issue of why the Plymouth brethren split constantly and why their divisions were so heated and so ugly. He said there's five reasons for that. Quote, this is a brethren writer today. Quote, one man dominated the movement. He was unaccountable and unchecked in his use of power. Differing views on non-essentials were not tolerated. Many times the teachings on non-essentials overwhelmed the central message of the gospel. No articles of the Christian faith kept the central doctrines in the forefront. In other words, they didn't have a doctrinal statement. They didn't believe in confessions. Or provided a reference point for doctrinal discussions, end quote. One final Spurgeon quote, you'll like the Spurgeon quote. He says, Plymouth Brethren, I mean, just, just imagine how upset Spurgeon would have to be to write this. Plymouth Brethren have no feeling wherever their principles are concerned. I know indeed of no sect or denomination so utterly devoid of kindness of heart. It is the most selfish religious system with which I am acquainted. It is entirely wrapped up in itself. It recognizes no other denomination, whether the Church of England or either of the nonconformist denominations as churches of Christ. Mr. Darby has again and again said in print, as well as in private, that those who belong to his party in the metropolis constitute the only church of Christ in London, end quote. J.N. Darby died in 1882. Many odd millennial movements began in the 1800s. I'm sure you've heard of Millerism and the Great Disappointment of 1844. There's Seventh-day Adventism. All that stuff. Mormonism is one of those strange millennial groups, Seventh-day Adventism, the Jehovah's Witnesses. America in the 19th century was an incubator for cults. The saddest part of all of this, to me, having studied this history, is the marked shift in American Christianity away from preaching Christ and him crucified in the gospel and to this morbid focus on this weird prophetic stuff. And all these books and novels... Wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone got a copy of The Plan of Salvation by B.B. Warfield instead of the Left Behind books? Or a copy of R.C. Sproul's Faith Alone instead of Apollyon or Nikolai, The Rise of the Antichrist or The Late Great Planet Earth? Many of you are probably wondering at this point, how does something that odd, that contentious, from such weird background that split over and over and over again. How did that come to dominate American Christianity? Very simply stated, here's how. One of Darby's converts to his new wine, he called it, this idea of a rapture before a seven-year tribulation and these weird prophetic teaching, was a, name, was a guy named James H. Brooks. Most people have not heard of him. James H. Brooks was a prolific writer. He wrote more than 200 tracts and booklets spreading these dispensationalist ideas all over the place. And those tracts and booklets fell into the hands of a man named Cyrus Ingerson Schofield. So Darby converts a guy, industrious writer, James H. Brooks, and he brings along Cyrus Ingerson Schofield. Schofield does what? He annotates these views into the reference notes of his Schofield reference Bible. And almost every person in America had one of those. Vern Poitras, in his book on dispensationalism, says, quote, The Schofield Reference Bible contributed more than any other single work to the spread of dispensationalism in the United States. I want to tell you, Christianity and other parts of the world, ever since this all started here, ever since this became the dominant force here, have looked at us and our eschatology and scratched their head and gone, man, American Christians are weird. They look at the Left Behind series and this pre-trib rapture stuff, and they're like, what in the world happened over there? Why do they believe all this? Isn't it incredible that a small, very divisive, very contentious, little restorationist group, fringe movement, the Plymouth Brethren, whose founder, J.N. Darby, rises to become practically a cult leader who excommunicates the whole world 
discovers these new wine doctrines. Nobody ever saw them in the Bible before, and they have such incredible influence. How that happened? It happened through the Schofield Reference Bible primarily. Now we could go into great detail about Cyrus Ingerson Schofield's past. It's very sketchy, very sketchy past. But we don't have time to go into all that now. Jerry Johnson from NiceneCouncil.com does an excellent overview of dispensationalism and its history. They also have a whole documentary about C.I. Schofield. There's a lot about his past you might want to look into as well. But that's dispensationalism for you. That's where it came from. What do you think? It's pretty compelling stuff? Not really. And it's really hurt the Christian church. And by the way, before we close, it's getting harder and harder to find old school dispensationalists today because they have been so thoroughly criticized by covenant theologians that now you have what's called progressive dispensationalism. And when you hear definitions of progressive dispensationalism, you know what it sounds a lot like? What we believe. They've moved away from some of that older stuff and they're moving in the right direction, so that's a good thing. But I would encourage you, read good books. Don't read the Left Behind series, it's trash. It's theological trash. Read good books and believe what scripture says about eschatology. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you again for this time to be together and pray that you'd bless us as we go our separate ways and help us to be Bible readers like George Mueller uh, so that we know errors when we see them and we pray that we would have a bigger heart to know and follow you uh, all of our days. In Jesus' name, amen.